Welcome back, guys, to the Bear Podcast Show, episode 20, with me, Sean Scullion, a.k.a. The Handsome Stranger. Owen Mallon, a.k.a. The Bear. We have Aidan, the face for radio behind the scenes. And today we have Nando Brown. Welcome. Thanks very much. Cheers for having me. Thank you for coming, Nando. So, Nando, uh, we've we had a bit of a chat before we, we uh, started the pod here, but we're going to delve into your life and, and your history and, and give you a bit of a quiz and... and uh, Find out who you are and how we got here today. Lovely. So, take us from the start, Nando. Oh, right, well, so we're talking, what, 44 years old now? Mm-hmm. How does that creep up on you? I don't know how that even begins. I like. know, I know. <laughs> 38. <laughs> uh, I'm 38. 38. Still only a pop like. Yeah. I don't. I, uh, the years my paper round was harder than most, so <laughs> the years haven't been kind to me. <laughs> I, uh, believe it or not, I'm actually younger than Sean. <laughs> <laughs> but, 44. Nando. Yeah. 44 back here, um, brought up in uh, just outside London, Hertfordshire, um, lived around uh, the Middlesex area, yeah. uh, went to school around there and, like, and I was always a, I was always a good good kid, believe it or not, I was a good kid here, it wasn't until <laughs> after. <laughs> I you sound, like, you sound like you're reassuring yourself, <laughs> I was a good kid. <laughs> I'm sure I was, I'm sure I was, they can't hear me, can my parents. So um, no, um, yeah, I brought up around um, the south of the UK and uh, I was a absolutely committed to becoming a Royal Marines commander like that was the only thing that I thought I was going to do for the rest of my life and things didn't pan out that way um I, I was a marine I was I was a marine for seven years and um there's a hell of an experience there like but there's also I, I'm I'm quite conflicted about the whole thing because I joined the marines at 15 years old you joined at 15? yeah and it's too young. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, uh, I was a fucking boy. Like, uh, and I shouldn't have been allowed to, like, I was trained to kill people, but I wasn't allowed to drink a beer. Yes. It's not right. It's not right. So you joined at 15? 15 years old. Straight out of school? Straight out of school. Um, and I was, like, I was convinced that was my lifelong thing and I was, that, that was how it was going to play out. But um, uh, I joined at 15 and I went through training and it was like eight months of like it's graft it's proper graft and you're waking up and like you you shit like 50 of us started yeah 50 of us started training 10 of us passed training four of us are still alive jesus shit yeah it's not all right it's not all right so it takes a, a special type of grip mental to to go through that does it it does there, yeah there's 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 and it is it's all mental like there's a lot of physical involved but actually if you if you've got that tuned in then you're going to your body will take you there so uh, and one of the advantages of being so young is that to me it was just an adventure training was like a, an adventure yeah. like cuz i was like oh we're never going you know they're never going to kill us they're never going to and um, and that was all very kind of it was all very like a game and then one bloke fell off uh, uh, what we called a Tarzan assault course and he broke his back and I was like oh this is real yeah <laughs> I was like oh hang on a minute but it took that for me to realize because I was just too young to join like you, you were you well certainly speaking for myself I was still a baby like and I wasn't ready for that world like for me I should have joined at 21 if I was going to do that kind of thing but you know there's there, it did shape who I became and there again are pros and cons involved in that as well. So, like, did you do any tours? I did no tours. So I was I was um, in the middle of Northern Ireland yeah. and Iraq. Um, so luckily, but back then I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. You know, like, yeah. and I look back now and go, fuck it. I was very lucky. Yeah, yeah. I was very lucky because I've got friends that went out to Afghanistan. I've got guys that were in training with me, died out there, and um, and it's and I look back and I just think, what for? What for? Like it's, it's bonkers. But you, you're just so convinced that you're the good guy. And actually, there's a, a question that my son posed to me not long ago, and we were he was looking at soldiers on the news, and, and he said, uh, "Are they the good guys or the bad guys?" And I went, 
I said, the problem is, mate, I said, every soldier thinks they're the good guy. Yep. Every fucking, like, it doesn't matter what side they're on, they think they're the good guy. So it depends where you're sitting. Um, and you could see him kind of go, oh, I wasn't the answer I was expecting. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's, it's, it's so confusing because there's, there's so many similarities in, in all the things that we see around the world. Religion, like, like if you're born in a certain place, you're Muslim. If you're born in a different place, you're Christian. If you're like, and there's, it, it's just, I don't know, for me, it's so conflicting now when I look back because there are so many good times at Iden Marines, but it's also just messy with, with like, I think horror. I th yeah, and I would pose this question to you. Would you let your son join? No, no, no. So. Definitely not. No, I wouldn't. Like, um, I think there's so much more to life. Like, well, it's horrible to, to say that. Like, when my nephew joined, he joined uh, the Gibraltar Regiment and he ended up going out to Afghanistan. Yeah. Like, I was stressing. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? Well, hang on, hang on. What are you fighting for? Like, not like, forget the politics around it. I was like, what are you fighting for? Because you're my family. I can't risk you dying mm -hmm. for fucking some ridiculous thing, whatever's going on. But I, I was so, so stressed about it. And there's, there's uh, obviously if my son was 21 and he went, I'm joining, there's nothing I can do. Yeah. But if he turned to me That's at 15. That's not what you want for him. No, I don't want that for him. There's, much, there's so much more to life. So much more. But do you, see, so you're only a child when you think back on that 15, when you think what is, you know, when you're 50, even when you're an 18 year old or a thing, but you'd have grown up so quick. Would, does, did it shape you then for the rest? Like hundred percent, totally, totally shaped me, and um, I'm, I am quick to anger. I am, uh, I, I'm, I'm. It's like, like it sounds so corny, but you're trained in violence, and you're yeah. like, and actually, you, they spend eight months making you into this person that they want you to be, this soldier, and then when you leave nothing see you later handshake yeah, well yeah. done good job thanks very much yeah how, how, how do you how do you flick that switch you don't you don't and that's why there's so many ex-forces homeless so many ex-forces in prison dead suicide like it's there's so many of them there's so many of them and even my mates that have done all right they're still a bit yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean so then you left it was a 22 what age did you just past 22 uh, just before 23 yeah and then uh, what 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 uh how do you how do you go about getting a job when you decide you're leaving you don't well i didn't like my so there's a there's a stretch of my life after the royal marines and before i found a passion that um i don't often talk about publicly yeah. um and that's because i didn't know what i was going to do with my life and i um I got into the wrong crowds and I, uh, for 10 years, didn't didn't work. Yeah. So but, but see, even on that though, you left whenever you were 22, was that just, you'd made the decision you didn't want to do it anymore? Or why, where did you leave? Uh, uh, so I was put forward by um, my troop officer for doing um, a joint sniper selection and um, recce troop selection. And they are like, they're, they're seen by all the lads as the next level up, if you like. And um, and uh, I was 17 at the time, and he came up to me and he said, I want you to go forward for this. And I was a bit like, what? where's this come from? Like, my dream was to be like special forces and do all that kind of stuff. And, and when he approached me, I was like, wow, but I'm not ready. Like, and I said to him, I'm not ready for yeah. that. And he was like, you're totally ready. You're, you're like, you should definitely go for it. Um, and I ended up in Brunei in the jungle doing my sniper selection and um, this recce selection. And it was, it made basic training look like a walk in the park because that was hard. That was really hard. And um, it was, what was it, a week, a couple of weeks? I can't remember now. Um, and I remember properly putting everything into it. And then I got called over by uh, the boss of, uh, that course and 
I got debriefed and, it, and there was a whiteboard there and I saw my name at the top of the board like, and I was a bit like, you're not serious, have I actually, like, I've, I've done it, like, mm -hmm. and that was a big thing for me and I walked in and he was like, listen, I want to tell you how well you've done and how, how impressed we are and how committed you are and, and I've spoken to all the boys and they, and they really like you and, uh, and we think you're going to go far and da da da, but and I just felt my world melt away. And he just said, but you haven't got enough experience. And I was like, what, 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 what? okay. Like, and he said, and so I want you to come back in two years time. And that, and, and I didn't understand the importance of perseverance. So now perseverance for me is like a really, really big deal. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, you can, poke it mate yeah i'm done and i then started properly going off the rails while i was in the core um like i was flying over to spain and over here you could <laughs> you could um buy steroids over the counter in the pharmacy yep. and i would come over fill up a case full of steroids flying back to uk sell them to all the marines right? and then I, I went hang on there's a there's a market here <laughs> uh, and and then i just got i just properly went off the rails i was i was um like uh just rude to everybody rude to the the staff rude to the thing and then there was this there was this thing in the core where when uh, it used to be illegal to be gay like illegal you'd get arrested for it so guys that wanted to leave would go uh i'm gay so they'd have, they'd have to be discharged. But as my time approached, they changed the law and made it illegal, uh, made it legal. And there was almost like this pro-gay push. Um, and then the lads were just fucking lads and they started hanging up homosexual calendars and that kind of stuff. And I was like, I know how to get out of here. So I walked up and I went, I'm homophobic. Like, and they, uh, they were like, oh shit, what do we do with this? We didn't expect this. Yeah. And I was like, there's going to be, uh, I'm going to cause trouble. And at the time I was stationed at HMS Northwood, which is um, in Hertfordshire, not far from where I was brought up. And uh, every day I was being given a loaded weapon, or two loaded weapons. And they were, and I was like, I'm a fucking time bomb. I'm telling you, I'm a time bomb. And they were like, let's probably get rid of this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they signed me off and I, uh, uh, I left, I had to serve my full full notice, but they kind of pulled me back from work. They kind of moved me away from that stuff. So I've got a love-hate relationship with the court. I, I love it. I love some, like, but it's like anywhere. Like you've got, I've met some of the best friends, like some of the top, top people I've ever fucking met in my life, but also some of the scummiest yeah. dickheads you'll ever meet as well. So you'd all developed all these skills. You'd now seen a market in Spain. So what was the next step? Uh, move to Spain. Move to Spain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I like I, the weather. I can, see, I, <laughs> I can see a rocky patch developing here. So you were disgruntled. You were out of there. Yeah. The passion that you had for the core, you, you become disillusioned. And then now you're just out on the, the rip in Spain, is it? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I started working the doors in uh, clubs local to here. Um, I started doing bits and pieces, knocking around with guys that would hire you for, you know, freelance work. <laughs> they were um, making use of the skills that you... <laughs> and then, uh, and then you just, you just like, uh, it was a rough patch. It was a really, really rough patch. Like, we, we won't tie you down. Again. <laughs> but, uh, we'll keep poking at you here to you tell us some stories. <laughs> and look, listen. South of Spain is a dangerous part of the world too. There's, yeah. there's that underbelly and, and, and crime and well documented in, in, in Costa del Sol. But there would have been plenty of work for somebody with your skill set. Yeah, there was. There was a lot of work. There was a lot of work. And um, I had I had a, a sense of morals about me. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't just running around like beating up old women. Like, I, there was a... Cool. There was a... There was a... There's a proper culture to it. Yeah. Like, and... and like I don't want to like come across like oh, look at me the four foot hard man. Uh, there was 
a few times where I nearly messed up, <laughs> like working the doors as a as a club up the road here called the uh, London Underground. And I remember my first night on the door, and I'm standing there, and uh, this lump comes in, like it's a big dude, like, and I, I'm I'm like, crikey, like you know, but I'm also well aware of that the rest of the door team don't know me, I don't, like they've got no respect for me, you know. And I'm like, like if something goes off, I've got to go full tilt. And I'm standing there. This guy comes down the stairs. I remember it really well. And uh, he comes up to the girl behind the till and he goes, oh, all right, love. You're going to come in for a drink tonight? She goes, oh, I can't. I've got to look after the till. And, she, and it went backwards and forwards a little bit. And, and he went, no, 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 come on, come on. And then he grabbed her by the wrist. And I then grabbed him by the wrist. Uh, and I was like, she said she can't go in, mate. And he just looks at me and the, the guy behind him overshadows this big dude and just goes, wait, 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 he doesn't know, he doesn't know, he doesn't know. And I'm like, I'm going to die. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> like, and then the boss comes rushing out along with four members of the door team. The door team will go, oh, hello, sir. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and the boss is like, let me, let me get your bottle of champagne. Come in, you come in, you come. And... Uh, uh, and then the, the guys on the door went, you nearly died. <laughs> Who was it? Um, oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. <laughs> uh, he, uh, his name was Johnny Morrissey. So he was uh, put away for uh, money laundering 400 million, not long ago, a couple of months ago. Crazy. Shit. Yeah, 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 hardcore. And, and it, he was a... He was a very nice bloke and he was, he tipped very well. Thank you, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And you didn't die. I didn't die. I didn't die. No. But I learned my lesson. <laughs> I learned my but lesson. Like that, you know, that's, that is the sort of shit where that just could have gone horribly, horribly wrong. And yeah. then you get to know the landscape, the people about here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is some dangerous men out here. Very, very dangerous men out here. Because I always laughed and you, you see and they go, this is where they, they come when they're, they're, they're they're running at home, but they come here. But then, the that scene, obviously, yeah, you know, we're talking about that. You get involved in that there and that scene. It could very easily swallow you up. It nearly did. Well, it did for ten years. Like I I I did get swallowed up quite a lot. Like, um, did you have any brushes with the police out here? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a couple of um, nothing serious. Nothing, um, because there was nothing to convict me of. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, I did have, I had a really funny one actually. I was working the door, same club, and some black lad uh, uh, had to be taken out. And as uh, as I was taken out, and it was, wasn't like nasty or anything like that. But but the the club entrance has a stairs, uh, a set of stairs that that are steep, right? So I get to the top, and I'm like, come on in, mate. I've, you know, we're done. And he turns around and he puts a boot straight in my stomach and I'm stood on the edge of the stairs. And I just by the skin of my teeth managed to grab the corner to stop me rolling all the way down. At which point I lay into him and give him a couple of dicks. Um, and Tom tells me he regretted that. <laughs> <laughs> I, the police were called and uh, they put me in the cells and uh, I he tried to get me done for attempted murder, which is like, he'd, <laughs> fra he'd fractured his, he had a fracture in his skull, oh, but shit. it was, um, it was just one punch. It wasn't like a, a like I'd been stamping on me or anything like that. It was like, genuinely, it wasn't horrific. Um, uh, but uh, I got put in the cells and then one day uh, I'm sat there and I'm thinking, like, I'm, I'm angry anyway at this point in my life. I was, uh, I was, I was very, angry in general um and i'm in and it's weird because the cells over here are like the movies in the americans you know like where they've all got the one big cell with everybody yeah. in it one light bulb that's going <laughs> like there was all of that kind of stuff um and then all of a sudden one of the guardia comes down so guardia seville over here there are three types of police you've got the locals the nationals and the guardian you do not mess with the guardia seville yeah like, you don't like if they're a proper. You, they're, 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 proper. they're the more military. Style, yeah, aren't they? that's right. That's yeah. right. And you do not mess about with them. Anyway, he comes down, and he says something to me in Spanish, but he's he's speaking so fast I can't pick up what he's saying. 
and he sticks a bag of um, Burger King on the bar while he's talking to me. Blah, 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 and I'm like trying to decipher what he's saying. Right? And then all of a sudden he drops his hand and turns around and walks off, says something to somebody else and then walks out stuff. And I'm like, he's forgotten his Burger King. Grab hold of it and I'm like, fuck, stuffing it in my face. <laughs> <laughs> Screw it, it'll be worth a laugh anyway. <laughs> and I put this Burger King down my face as fast as I can. Anyway, the next day, I'm expecting him to come down and give me a hiding. Um, but the next day, uh, I get let out. And as, as I get let out, my dad's standing at the top. He's like, are you all right, man? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm all right, I'm all right. No, it was, I'm sorry, and all the rest of it. And we're walking back, and he goes, uh, did you get your Burger King? Oh, <laughs> and I was like, yeah. what, you gave it? I like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> thought I'd had one over, but I hadn't at all. You could, have, just you could have sat there me. and enjoyed it. <laughs> Say again? You could have sat there and enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I really could have done. I really could have done. <laughs> so then, Nando, uh, obviously, you know, there must have been a changing point there. <laughs> normally, it's normally women or something or children or something. But there, there was a change. You must have realised then at this point, this hasn't got a, a long or this. It wasn't. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was. I fell into um, a passion that I had no idea that was inside me. I had no idea. Um, I'd split up with this girl that I was seeing and uh, I thought, I'm going to get a dog. And I did no research. I did no kind of thing. I went out and I bought this um, Staffordshire Bull Terrier. And uh, she was dead easy. Like, she'd come to the pub with me. She'd be off lead. Like, like she'd come everywhere with me. Like, proper like proper person dog i could sit here and she'd just chill here and she was brilliant brilliant br best dog and i thought oh, this is really easy so i got another dog uh, and i was still in that world and a mate of mine was quite into his dogs and he had seen this breed called a canna corso now a canna corso is an italian ma mastiff it is a beast we're talking 50 60 kilos of dog well f uh, between 40 to 60 kilos of dog and they are proper, proper dogs, right? And this, I, I, I went and got this puppy. I made every mistake you could possibly make. I made, I got the wrong breed for starters. I went, I, I went to the wrong breeder. I did the wrong type of socialization. I did the wrong, I picked the wrong puppy. I remember going to the house and me being a bit like, oh, this, it's in South London and me going, this is a bit of a dive. And then um, as I walk into the front room where all the puppies are, this dog outside is throwing itself at the conservatory door, trying to get at me. And I'm like, is that, is that normal? And the breeder's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's just protecting her puppies. And I was like, right, okay. And they're all playing, which is a good sign. And then there's one that's like peeking around the sofa, but he's lying down. And I thought, oh, that'd be good. He'll grow up and he'll be quiet and keep himself to himself. And that's not what I was looking at. I was looking at a scared puppy. And I went, oh, that, oh that, that, that'll be good. I want a dog that's going to be chill. And she was like, she just saw me coming. And she was like, yeah, that's the one you want, mate. That's the one. Yeah, you, you have that one. Yeah. And I paid stupid money for this dog. Like three grand for a, for a poorly bred, like this, this poor dog was a mess. Uh, anyway, as he started to grow up, he turned into a fucking monster monster started biting people started biting other dogs he was completely out of control and i went to i went to dog trainer after dog trainer after dog trainer trying to get him sorted out nobody could help nobody could help and then one day um i was advised that uh having him neutered would sort out his behavior so i took him to the vet to have him neutered it was almost, almost like he knew and i said to the vet i said look um he's really nervy uh, just give him a second to settle down and he was hiding behind my legs and uh, he had his front feet on the scales to weigh him and uh, she went while he's there I'm gonna I'm gonna weigh him she comes up and picks up his back end and moves him onto the scale and literally drops him and as the as his rear paws touch it he sprang round and just nailed her straight on the throat Bam! Bosh! she went flying across the floor she had claret coming out of her neck and i was just like 
they're going to kill him. Fuck. Yeah, and at which point I'm like, how do I get out of here? Like, and I'll go in through the window, I'll, I'll pick him up, we'll go through the window and we'll be off. Like, and I'm, it's all going through my head and I thought, well, somebody's going to come in in a minute and they're going to try, I'm going to drop him and then we're going to have to run out the front and, uh, and properly trying to work out what the right thing to do is. Well, this poor woman has got, like, bite marks in her throat. A dog like I could kill someone like Oh, easily, easily. And what I didn't understand at that point is if one of them dogs did turn on you, I don't care how strong you are. You ain't stopping it. But, uh, so I, 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 was, I was really conflicted as to what to do. Uh, and then eventually she came back in. And she's like, got that. It wasn't deep, but, like, like there was, but there was puncture marks either side. Like, it's a good job that he kept his mouth open and just kind of punched her as opposed to... Bit. Bit. Because that, that's it. That's it. It's game over, mate. And, um, and then uh, uh, she said to me, right, that either we have to put this dog to sleep or you have to go and see the Royal Veterinary College medical expert on vicious animals uh, and go through behaviour modification. And I was like, I've been looking for help. I want help. I want to sort this out. I reached out to all like the TV trainers. I'd reached out to everybody. I was like, and I was flush back in the day, like because I was still in that part of my life. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I was like, um, like whatever you want, like whatever you want, just sort this out. Like, I sent them away, like all of that stuff. Anyway, I ended end up seeing this fellow who was meant to be like the the top. Um, drive a couple of hours to go and see him. I walk in. The man is terrified of my dog. Like, he's terrified. I could see him sitting there. And in fairness, he was, he was worried about me as well. And we had a, we had a funny old altercation. Like, he gave me this, this technique to use, what, what I now know as counter conditioning and desensitization, right? which is a standard protocol that a lot of dog trainers use. Um, they might implement it differently. And he had his own kind of style of doing it. And, and when he did, I, I needed coaching because it's not something you can just do on your own. Like, the dog training industry is a funny old game because if you have a, a leak in your house, you call a plumber and the plumber fixes the leak. If you have a problem with your dog, the dog trainer comes over and he tries to teach you how to be a dog trainer. Yes. Like, and it's, a, it's a, so like dog trainers are trying to teach novice handlers to teach novice animals. Yeah. Like, and it, there's such a mismatch there. But anyway, I needed coaching and I tried to reach out to him. I emailed, I called, I think, and he was ignoring my calls. I like, managed to get to his reception, like speak to the receptionist. Oh, he's really busy. We'll get back to you, blah, blah, blah. And like, I can't remember what it was, but I think it was like a couple of months had passed and I'm like implementing the plan completely incorrectly, just through ignorance. So like, I've got this, I've, he must've been 50 kilos on the end of a lead like lunging at people and I'm going here take a piece of food like, yeah. I'm, like, and I was getting it all wrong but um, eventually he said I'm really sorry I've had a load of problems go on and I, and I was like not the most uh, compassionate person back in the day and I was a bit like I don't really care like come to my house get this squared away and he came to my house and um, uh, they also medicated him so they, they put him on like um, antidepressants the equivalent of and um like i said it's not working like he's he's furious like he's livid and then we he came around to the house and he said uh i think it's time we put this dog to sleep and i'm fiercely loyal still today and i think that's probably something from the marines i'm like, um, once once i'm once somebody's in they're in like but if you're out you're out and he is basically telling me that i should kill a member of my family and i said i'm going to count to five and i'm going to let the dog off the lead and he went oh, come get me. and i said one <laughs> two and the man panicked <laughs> grabbed his stuff left out the door and I just sat there and I sat there in tears just going I just want somebody to help me I just want somebody to help me like, I don't want to fucking kill him I'm not giving up on him I'm not like I've tried the medication thing I've tried like 
I must have been through nine, ten dog trainers before him. Um, and eventually I, I found what, who was, became my first mentor. Um, and they were willing to coach me and they, they helped me through that problem. It's not how I would deal with it today, but it doesn't matter because she was there helping me. Um, so that, that's how I fell into becoming a, a dog trainer. Uh, and and then when I realised that training dogs, or actually I was quite good at it, like it just consumed me. And what sounds is might sound ridiculous to a lot of people, but I was still being naughty then. And I remember doing one drive where I had to go to a meeting, and I was driving up uh, to Leicester. And as I'm driving up, I've got my two dogs in the van, and I thought if this all goes sideways. My dogs are going to be left on their own and some, they're definitely going to kill him. They'll definitely kill him. And that was the day that I stopped. I went, I'm, I can't risk jeopardising their safety for what I'm doing. It's, it's weird because a lot of people obviously don't, you know, my, my parents, they have their dog and they love. People don't understand the, obviously dog owners, well, people don't understand the attachment, the 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 love, the the love. Yeah, yeah. And people yeah, yeah. like I, I have seen, witnessed it firsthand. Even my father, he mourned the loss of of Sasha, his dog. He like you know it it properly affected him. Hundred percent. And I don't ha I'm not that person. So I I genuinely yes, I wouldn't have a dog because I don't have the love. I don't I like dogs, but I wouldn't have yeah, a yeah, wife's yeah. pile of them, but. It, people don't understand, you know, having an animal, somebody's loyal, you know, that it, it's, it's man's best friend. Yeah. So that's what stopped you. That stopped me. That literally stopped me. Like, because I, I wasn't willing to risk jeopardising them. Because at that point in my life, I had, um, I had my very close school friends who have always been, like there's four of us that have always been a very, very tight unit. But actually... Like day in, day out, I was with my dogs. Like day in, day out, they'd come on jobs with me, they'd come, like everything. It was, they were family, right? And I didn't have that. I wasn't like this kid that went, oh yeah, I love animals. I, I can talk to the fucking goldfish. That wasn't me. I, I wasn't that person. Um, but going through like some of the toughest times and those dogs always being there for me was, um, was, Game changing for me. Game changing. So now you're you now you train dog trainers. I now train dog trainers. So if somebody wants to become a dog trainer or a uh, animal behaviourist, I run an online school. Uh, I do in person stuff as well, but I run mainly an online school for those people that want to learn how to do that. That's more, that's, and that is I'm just as passionate about that as I was about training dogs in the first place. So tell me, is there a certain type of breed? that you would say is more aggressive than others, or like, is a way a Shih Tzu going to be as aggressive as, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean though? But like, is there a certain breed and you're like, they're a bad wee brute? It, but the thing is, is that, <clears throat> um, like, breeds are important. There are tendencies, okay? They all have tendencies. Now, when I talk about breeds, it's just a generalisation, okay? Um, because there's always going to be an outlier. Yeah. There's, you know, you might have um, you, you a, a border collie yeah. Yeah, that doesn't want to herd sheep. Right? He's just not interested in it. Right? And that's, that's totally normal. That's the way that genetics lie. But it's a numbers game. So if we were going to have a competition at who could round up the most sheep, right? I'm picking a Border Collie. Right? And it, like, let's say there's a Border Collie, a Shih Tzu, and a Rottweiler. I'm picking the Border Collie. Because it, the likelihood is that out of a hundred of them, 99 are going to do a good job. Yeah. And there might be 10 rotties that do a good job and one shih tzu that does a good job. All right? But they've all got their jobs. They've all got their, their specialisations. So it depends on how you define is there one that's more aggressive than the other. They always say there's no bad dogs, just bad owners. That's bullshit. Is it? Yeah, yeah. That's bullshit. Like, dogs are very much individual. Yeah. Right? And you have, and again, like, it's such a, Weasley answer, but you've got to define what you mean by bad. What's bad? Like, 
Is it a dog that nails other dogs? Is it a dog that bites people? Or is it like, if we say, right, it's a dog, dog that bites people is a bad dog. All right, well, then we probably shouldn't have spent hundreds of years breeding certain dogs to be wary of strangers. Like, because that they're doing their job. Like, the we, we, we grew up in a, in a council estate, and, and, and I used to see people would have kept dogs, and I used to think to myself, more now, because I see, like, my dad would walk the dog in the morning and walk in the evening, and he says, if you didn't do that, you'd go mad, you know, yeah. it, it was thing. And I was like, these people used to they get these dogs and leave them in the backyard yeah. all day, and then, you know, they would throw out something to eat and maybe throw a ball, and I was like, you would go mental if you were locked up. 100%. But it did go mad. Oh, the the oh. dog that I think you're talking about, ah, it ah. did get out, it got out, and sure, bit you. Yeah. It, it actually, like we were all playing football, and we Just come up were behind. running to climb up in fences to get out of the road of the dog. Yeah, yeah. And it trying to grab you by the foot and everything yeah. to get biting at you. Yeah. And, like, that dog was put down. Yeah, yeah, it was. put down. Do. Yeah, yeah, because, like, the, the problem is there that, that if you keep a dog in that kind of situation, like, you would go mad, mm-hmm. you'd go mental. Like, think about it when, you're, when you have a day off, right? You go, I'm going to sit on the sofa and do nothing today. That gets boring really quickly. Like, if you do that for two days in a row, well, like, I can't do a day, but some people, you might get a week at max and go, do you know what, I've had a really nice relax there. Like, all of a sudden, it becomes a prison. Like, doesn't matter who you are. Like, sooner or later, you go, I need to get out of this house. Yeah. Like, think about COVID, how many people went, well, I'm done now, I need to get out, I need to get out. Like, it was bad for mental health. Keeping a dog in a garden or walking it for less than an hour once a day, they can't make the same association and go, hang on. Like, I couldn't stay in my house. When I was told I was only allowed out for one walk a day, like, it was driving me nuts. But now we're saying, oh, that dog's going to go out for 15 minutes around the block and it'll be all right. Yeah. Do you ever come across an owner and you're like, you shouldn't have? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just- like, 100%. And not, in, not even in a nasty way. The, the biggest problem is people getting the wrong dog. But also, not being aware of the work. Like, I, I'd see my sister, if she's going to go away, she has to make arrangements that she has a dog sitter that comes and, and she's actually brilliant. To take. But not being aware of the, la- the, the, the work that's yeah. involved. You know, you know, just basically clean up. But I mean, you're saying that there. I was like, thinking to myself, I wouldn't have the time, but... If you were to give people advice and you'd say to them, look, listen, the best way to, if you were going to pick and, and a family was going to pick, what, what would your advice be to? Like the, the cheesy answer is do your research. Uh, the problem with that is that when you're doing your research, all of the breed books, all of the websites that are telling you about whichever dog that you're into are written by people that love that animal, that love that breed. It's not. It's not a. It's not an impartial view. It really isn't. It's a very rose-tinted view on what you're looking at. So, and there's code, like um, this is a very much a one-man dog. What that should say is he fucking hates strangers, like, <laughs> like, and that's a different thing because if you sit here and go, oh, yeah, me and my dog, we're gonna go to the cafe, and we're gonna chill because we're a team. Like, that's a lovely vision that you've painted in your mind. But if that dog's trying to nail every person that goes past. It's not the same experience. You're not sitting there enjoying your coffee. Like, you're frustrated because the dog's like popping up the waiter when he's bringing over your coffee and that kind of stuff. Um, and there's, there, is a, there is a real mismatch of, of person and dog. It's getting the right dog. We are massively led by our eyesight. So we go, that dog looks cute. I'll take that one. And the problem with that is that there's genetics involved. And you can't out train genetics but i'm going to ask you this because see at home there's a massive especially in northern ireland and ireland as a whole there, because it's such a, a a big market now animals are like you're saying three and that's like i see them we blue french uh bulldogs like the people are saying the four and five but becoming inbred and and poorly bred dogs you know they're breathing like i've seen this yet too that they're saying that they're they're trying to get the small dog and you're getting literally getting the runt of of one litter and, and, and another and you're trying to make them smaller and and, and genetically modify the, uh, surely then that that becomes more like especially these dogs are being inbred so like that that, that has its own 
But like that's massively becoming because it's such a big market now. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You're talking thousands of pounds per litter. Yeah. So like these guys, the it's, ma- it's very rife at home, and they're catching them. Uh, there was a guy caught there on the boat, they're catching them going back and forth, and the, the pu- uh, puppy farms and, yeah. and litters and that. But like, you know, as I, what would you know? How would you know to watch for that? It's a it's a difficult game. It's a really really difficult because game. it is a complex cr- it's a crime. Like they're doing what yeah. they're doing. Is. It's a massive crime, and there there is a big big problem. So they've um, like. <laughs> One of the best things that you could do if you are looking to get a dog is hire a professional to help you because they'll, they're, they're going to run you through what type of dog is suitable because dog trainers, our job is to spend loads of time with dogs and we're not just running around going, oh, this is great, oh, I get to live them. Usually people only see a dog trainer when they've got a problem. So we get to see the worst of the breeds. Mm-hmm. Right? So we get to see the other version when they say like, this dog is is a one man dog. We get to see this dog is a wary of strangers, and um, a dog trainer generally has quite a well rounded view on the health of different breeds. Like some of the breeds are horrific, like the the, the bulldogs, the French bulldogs, like the the Shih Tzus, all of what we call brassif- brachycephalic breeds, which have got the squash noses. They are struggling just breed just to breed. It's not okay, like, but that's just the health. You've then got the temperament to consider and the breeder and, and is the breeder a good breeder? And what I mean by that is don't go to the person that sold me my dog because that dog was inbred. Now inbreeding is actually quite a standard practice in the dog breeding world. Like, it's, it's mad, but that's how they keep the genetic pool small enough to keep a breed looking like a certain type of dog. Um, now there are lots of responsible breeders out there um, or you go to a shelter and rescue a dog and there, there are pros and cons to both like everybody goes oh if I get a puppy it's a blank slate it isn't a blank slate there is code written into that dog and it's whether that code gets expressed gets opened up um, through its environment through its training through its nutrition like there's so many different factors that people don't consider and they and I'm, I'm not belittling anybody I did that that's how I became a professional. I literally said, I split up with this girl and went, I'm going to get a dog. I went out, literally bought the first dog that I saw. Yeah. Oh, I love her. She looks great. No research, nothing. And it, I landed on my feet because she was easy. Didn't work the second time round. I went, I'll get a dog. I'll get that one. And it yeah. all went pear-shaped. You ever Nando just, and I know this will be the last, especially from what we're, we're speaking to the last thing, but you ever come across a dog and you're like, there's no, you know, there's no help. There's the, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, I've, it, like, the, the, again, it's a, it's a multifaceted question because it's not just you can't help this dog. This dog might be all right in the hands of a dog trainer. Um, this, this dog might be all right in a different environment. And then you've got to weigh up the pros and cons. Is this dog dangerous? Is he going to bite somebody? And if he is going to bite somebody, what sort of damage is he going to do? Is it a, is it a toothless chihuahua or is it a, a German shepherd that could do some serious damage? You know, because like, although we say like every dog can bite, the damage that can be done afterwards is, is different. It's different. And then, right, let's say that this, this dog is going to bite somebody. Like, who's in the house? Yeah. Is there a four-year-old in the house? Like, and is this four-year-old at risk? Like, because then, what's the way up? Like, at what point do you go, mate, you need to re-own this dog, or we need to put this dog to sleep? And there are dogs that do need... that. Like, there's just not enough houses, there's not enough homes there's not, that, are, that are suitable for those dogs. Yeah. Because if you look at the rescue centres, there are hundreds of dogs that don't have behavioural issues, that are, like, good pet dogs right so it, it's a really really difficult question to answer but but realistically the skill set that was required for some dogs some owners will never be able to achieve so tell me you're talking there about uh, german shepherd there you know the likes mm. a big dog um do you train any dogs to attack yeah 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 <laughs> so tell me a wee bit about that that sounds exciting it really is exciting is it? it's exciting and it's not as it's not as simple as training a dog to attack so yes. what I compete 
in a sport uh, called Mondio Ring. And um, Mondio Ring is a, what we term as a protection sport. And the protection, the, the sport has three elements to it. So you have obedience, you have agility, and you have um, protection. So when we get the dogs to attack, uh, they attack somebody wearing what's called a bite suit, which is like full See the on. cops using them and, and taking people down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's like several different types of attack the dog has you to do. You love getting that suit on too, oh, do you? Honestly, it's such <laughs> an adrenaline buzz. It's such an adrenaline but buzz. But you get to see then the power that, especially the German Shepherds and the, the agility and how, and how powerful and stuff they are. They're phenomenal, but they're, they're not the dogs that you need to worry about. Because that, the people that do that stuff spend hours and hours every week training their dog. Because you see a lot of lame cop shows where they have the thing, and, and they would say, I remember seeing, it was on a show, and he had his German Shepherd, and it was coming close to the end of the, the dog's service, you know, they, they worked the nine or, or whatever age, I'm not sure, but it was coming close to the end of his service, but he he, he keeps the dog, and, and obviously they had a real close relationship, but your man tried to stab him, the dog got in, and... and then you seen the cop instantly when he stabbed his dog. He, he was like, "Shit, my dog!" You know, it, it all changed. You know, and and, and like honestly, I was, I was thinking there myself when you were saying that he was that he was that passionate and, and, and built up that much relationship with his dog. Like if he was armed at that time, he was shooting you, man. Like he was putting him down. Like, yeah. But it you see there, and you're saying about your the training. Is it is there like a breed that's brilliant at that? Yeah. Yeah. German yeah. Shepherd is it? Nah. Which Belgian one? Shepherd. Oh, they're the dark ones, aren't they? They're, the Ma they're Malinois, so they come in various different colours. They look like a German Shepherd, but they, they, they've they got like a... They're, they're smaller, they're a little bit finer, um, they have uh, shorter hair, so you get those long, furry German Shepherds. These, these aren't like that. Um, and they're like a German Shepherd on speed. They are phenomenal animals. Horrific pets. <laughs> Terrible. You'd never want one as a pet. Like, they're, they're the worst dogs. Like, because they need massive amounts of exercise, and even more, they need loads and loads of mental stimulation. You need to work their brain, because that dog will go crazy. Yeah. That dog will go crazy. They're clever, aren't they? Super, super smart. Now, again, like, when, when we say this, people go, I want a smart dog. Like, no, you don't. You want a thick dog. Right? Uh, right? Uh, <laughs> if you get a dopey dog, he's... Is going to be easier to look after and think. These smart dogs, they need so much more. Like they need you to work their minds, their brains. And if you don't do that, the consequences are dire for everybody involved. Like they are super, super smart dogs, but they're strong, powerful, fast, and you need. You can't have an athlete. It's like having Mike Tyson and then taking him out for for one hour on a lead around the block. That ain't going to end well for you. Uh, well, tell me, see that type of dog then? You're not training that type of dog um, to not attack people. You're training it to attack. So, uh, so, you know what I mean? It's not a dog that you're trying to keep on a leash and say, do not attack everybody in here. You're actually training that dog to attack. No, right? so no? slightly different. Slightly different. Because I'm doing a sport. So, it's yeah. very much, we could we could use the Mike Tyson analogy. Like, Mike Tyson's probably not a good example, <laughs> but, but we could use the boxing you. analogy. <laughs> yeah, he will bite you. Um, so we could use the boxing analogy or the martial arts analogy, um, where, like, you get people in martial arts that are incredibly disciplined, okay, but they're also incredibly social, and if you mess about with them, like, they've got the techniques and the skills to to stop you. Yeah. Um, but they don't walk around just. Like smashing people up. We we had a guy. He's a world world champion MMA. Reese was on the thing, and he was a super chilled out guy. Like like just you know, you know, easy going. And I was like, I don't see anybody how they would even start an argument. But he would end you like. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Put you to sleep before you even know. And a hundred percent. And you don't need to walk around talking Charlie Large Buds. And it's the same for these dogs as well because because. If they can face a man who is screaming at them with a big bat and going, rawr, 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 and take it on, like walking down the street is not a problem. It's the dogs that are going, oh my God, I can't handle this. There's somebody sitting on that table. Oh my God, that's jumpy. That's made me like, these dogs are confident and like, they're not, they're not, um, 
and and then they're, 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 again, it's it, it depends. It depends on the type of training that you do and how you do it. And like, there are idiots on YouTube with like pillows wrapped around their arm, like with a dog tied to the tree. That's not what we're talking about here. That isn't that. That's you can't say that person's a black belt in jujitsu if they're doing that in the in the field like that. Like what we're talking about is a very disciplined, structured. Um, outlet for a dog that's been genetically bred to do that kind of work yeah. these are the dogs that the special forces skydive out of planes with these are the dogs that um took down osama bin laden but like the navy seals weren't the first people in well they were the first people in but the 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 malleys went in there first and took him down mm -hmm. like these are very very specialist dogs but they need specialist training they spend thousands upon thousands of pounds in training hours. They, I remember reading a thing saying that the one dog and the, the, the seals had these dogs, and they would spend over a hundred grand on on you know the training and, and and like they're saying that each soldier it costs so much to train each soldier, but they're saying how much it costs to train them. But Nando, I. I get from you, you're very passionate. A hundred percent. I can see, like, you and, love and, your and, job. And, like, and love it's, it. It's, 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 it's infectious. Like, you don't have to be a dog lover. To, when people are passionate about something, and, 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 and it's funny, it, it felt like you, you, you had Marines and you're passionate, you become disillusioned that, and then it you floated about till you, till you, you found your calling and, and, and that changed. And, and I think it's great for people there that's listening that. I've, I, I've enjoyed it. I, I, it's the passion I enjoy it I, and, I still don't think my wee girl uh, we shout it to her she's six today she's <laughs> oh, mad I'm Emily. happy birthday, happy birthday Emily. Emily. happy birthday so uh, she's been mad daddy can I get a dog daddy can I get a dog but I don't have time for a dog the, well, that, dog, the, the poor problem. dog is going to be at house in the house all day long by itself or as you say backyard and running about but you're, you've that made dog a conscious, needs time you, you, but you, you thought about oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, I, you know, have I got time to take it out in the morning before I go out? Have I, will I come home in the evening, clean up, interact with it? If you don't, don't do it. A hundred percent. hundred percent. And that's why I will not get a dog. And, and it's the right thing. Uh, but if I had all the time to give a dog, hundred percent I would have a dog. I yeah. love dogs. Love them. Yeah. And love hearing about them as well. And I think that dressing up in the suit and all and getting attacked. I'd love to do that. <laughs> there's there, there oh. is a lot that goes into that. I've got yes, to be really yes, clear yes. that there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. Like there's hours and hours and hours and it isn't, it's very structured. It's got to be done in a certain way. If yeah. you mess about with that kind of mm -hmm. thing, you don't know what you're doing, you're getting bitten. Mm -hmm. Right, and that, that hurts. When you get bitten by a dog, it hurts. Especially an, an athlete dog. A yeah. dog that's been worked and trained and-, and, and yeah, 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 it does. I got, um, I've had a couple of nasty bites in my career uh, and they say you're not a dog trainer who've been bitten and actually like the less you can get bitten the better, <laughs> the better you are, you are. Yeah. <laughs> but, but i have i have um encountered some really like tough dogs um where and, and it's those bites that make you realize that like even though the dogs as a whole their temperament is so um so malleable and it's so like bonded to humans that like there are dogs that get beaten by people and they they go back they return every time like they're just constantly pushing back to the to the human but like for instance one of the dogs that i took on um his name was rodders and he was a pit bull he was seized from a um a dog fighting gang and he was due to be put to sleep and I was contacted by the, the, the firm that took him and they said, we've got this dog, right. he's, a, he's an handful. Um, and I went and saw him and he was a lovely dog. 99% of the time, he was lovely. But 1%, he was a social hand grenade. Right. And he, he, like, he would play with my other dogs in the back garden, like, good as gold. And I remember the first time that there was a, a problem. Actually, it was uh, the worst bite he ever gave me. And um, he was running around playing with the can of Corso. They were, they were bouncing about and just playing with each other and doing all this thing. And he ran into my staffie. And she didn't take any crap. Like, she wouldn't put up with anything. So he bumped her just out of accident. And she had a little snap at him. But nothing serious totally normal dog communication she went bah, 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 like, and he jumped like 
I was like, what the? And I remember him moving off, and I'm doing the washing up, looking, just happened to be looking out, uh, and saw it. And I saw him literally go, I'm not having that. And he ran at her and smashed her so hard, literally like a ball, flicked her up into the air. She went flying round. And before she landed, wham, he bit her. Right. And I've gone running outside because we're talking about a pit bull and a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Like, That's not going to end well. Like, like they're, 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 they're scrappy dogs. Um, so anyway, I managed to get him off and get hold of her. And actually, he hadn't done much damage. It was more of a yeah. like show thing, but it sounded horrific. And I had hold of her and I was like, you're right. And he circled me. And it, this was not long after I first got him. And he circled me. It was almost like a shark. And, uh, and I put my arm out and was like, like, this isn't normal behavior. This is not okay. And then all of a sudden he came in and he just went, Boom. and I, I remember because it was the first proper bite that I'd had. And I remember seeing my arm go into his mouth and then his mouth closing and me trying to, I couldn't comprehend how my arm had disappeared because I couldn't see it. His, his face had come over. Mm -hmm. um, and and I went to shout, no. And I couldn't muster it. And I just went, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, if he shakes his head, my arm's broken. That's it, it's done. Yeah. Like, uh, like, and, I, and I remember, like, he just literally let go and moved back, like, really calmly. And I was like, and I picked up the other dog, walked inside, and I nearly passed out. And I'm sitting down, and I just thought, fuck this. And like, I, I fancied myself a bit back in the day. Like, I was like, like I, I could handle myself. And I was a bit like, I couldn't stop that dog if it, if it wanted to. I couldn't stop it. And I remember thinking, like, we, don't, we underestimate a lot of the dogs. And we, we underestimate how forgiving they are, considering the shit that we put them through. Putting a dog in a back garden for for its entire life and letting it out for a one hour walk is not okay. Do you ever see, I, I, I could just picture this, if you ever seen like somebody in their band a dog, I'd say you could be, they would they would get it there. Um, generally, I am a lot more compassionate than you would think. Like, I'll stop it. But I understand that they're behaving out of frustration and me having a pop at them isn't um, going to actually stop anything. Yep. Me stopping what's happening there and then and then explaining to them wow. a alternative way of doing and getting better results is much more effective than having a tantrum. Like... I, I love you see when people you don't you sure in their their passion and, and listening to them we were talking about this you were talking about a guy you'd met and he and he was keeping bees and, and yes that's right how passionate he was and it's very interesting and I, and I really really enjoyed this and and but what we're going to do here and there'll be a lot of people at home going geez I could get help there I have I have this issue or that issue we're going to put your details in 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 the video and they can contact you direct yeah absolutely and yeah yeah send me a message so I, what's I'm, your social media what's so um. You'll find me on Insta, on uh, Facebook as uh, Incredimal. So, um, but if you put in Nando Brown, uh, it will come up. Okay. I've got a YouTube channel called The School of Canine Science. Um, and if you're interested in becoming a dog trainer, that's what I do now. So most of the time when people do get in touch with me and they've got a problem, I can link them to a decent Good. trainer in that area who will actually coach them because that's what's needed. It isn't somebody coming around to your house telling you how, how crap you are and then that being it you need coaching you need to go through the problem um but it's doable it's doable well look nando uh first and foremost i'd like to thank you for coming along i've really enjoyed it and i uh it, it's it's interesting you turned your whole life around because of animals so uh, for a play to you uh, but i think the next time we're out in spain we'll have to get the suit on to you <laughs> no, I'm, I think you should. I've got it here. I've got it here. Oh, it's in the van. Keep it in the van. Keep it in the van. You're fine. That'll, that'll be a video all on its own, but Nando, thank you very, very much. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.